Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Linda Hansen. I'm the uh, spokesperson for the local Muncie, Delaware County League of Women Voters. And this morning we are pleased to have Angela Adams with us finally um, to talk about immigration in Indiana. Uh, hang on at the end, we're going to hear about our next programs from Judy Capone. Um, so right now, let me tell you something about Angela Adams. Uh, she's a native Hoosier who, quotes, found duty and purpose in educating employers, universities, immigrants, and the collective community on how the immigration system actually operates, something we clearly need to know. Uh, with her understanding in immigration law and background in education, government, internal corporate structure, human resources, and international services, she as she says, seeks to serve this great community and work as a bridge between employers, legislators, special interest groups, and immigrants. So prior to attending law school, Angela served as an education consultant for the Indiana Department of Education, the Division of Language Minority and Migrant Programs, where she assisted teachers of English language learners across the state of Indiana for nearly four years. She also taught English abroad in South Hill, Coahuila, Mexico, and I probably mispronounced that, and is fluent in Spanish. So welcome, Angela. Okay, so um, thank you so much for having me, and I apologize that it took so long. I think if you recall, the first time I was supposed to be with you, I broke my leg. That was crazy. Uh, I'm, I'm totally healed now, so that's wonderful. Um, and then last weekend, my daughter had a volleyball tournament, and so I appreciate your flexibility in, in moving me around. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you um, and get our PowerPoint up here. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about policy trends, recent and future, and I'm going to go through some of the um, the misconceptions and also just to, to give you kind of um, uh, an introduction, if you will. I, I always try to give you my experiences and speak to you about um, the actual real life cases that I handle on a daily basis. And I try really hard to leave the politics out of it. I don't want you to know how I vote. I don't want you to feel that I'm trying to tell you how to vote or who to support or which political party. Um, you'll see that, you know, it doesn't matter which political party, there are all kinds of immigration policies that have been done on both sides of the aisle. So um, I'm, I speak to you from experience and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, so with that, we're gonna talk about um, existing immigration law. Um, and the question that I get all the time and I've gotten for years, over 20 years in this uh, industry is, why can't undocumented immigrants just get legal? Why can't they just go fix their status, sign up? Why do they have to, why can't they just get their citizenship? Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about executive orders and the current state of immigration law and what to expect in the future and next steps. So first of all, some um, terminology. Are you a non-immigrant, an immigrant, or a U.S. citizen? So a non-immigrant is temporary. Non-immigrant in my world means someone who comes here on a temporary visa, a status that's issued to them for a specific purpose with an expiration date and intent to return home. So that means they are going to go home at the end of their student visa or the end of their um, B2 tourist visa or whatever it might be. An immigrant, on the other hand, is someone who's coming with permission to live and work in the United States indefinitely with certain limitations. Now, this is legal, the legal kind of definition. We use the term immigrant inclusively, right, to, to, to describe all people coming and that have come to the United States. But in my world, the legal world, this is kind of how we identify. U.S. citizen is someone who's going through naturalization or has been born in the United States. But if you haven't been born in the United States, you have to apply for 
what's called naturalization to become a US citizen. So most people go through a trajectory or a kind of pathway. They're a non-immigrant first, then they're an immigrant with intent to live here permanently, then after many years can apply to become a US citizen. So you can't just jump to US citizenship automatically. You have to kind of go through that process. And then this is state and federal laws at this time use the term alien to describe someone who is uh, coming to the US from another country. I, I think, I believe that the current administration has proposed to change that terminology. So what are non-immigrant visa categories? There are various non-immigrants. So someone coming here as a visitor, on a B2 visa maybe for a visit, a temporary period, six months, they're given six months and then they have to leave at the end of that six month period. Work visas, if you've heard of an H1B, someone who's coming to work in the United States in a, what's called a specialty occupation. Specialty occupation is one that requires a bachelor's degree minimum for the position and the job. The person has the degree and the job requires the degree. For an H-1B visa, there's an 85,000 annual cap. So every year we run out of H-1B visas because we exceed the cap uh, by almost two thirds. So the H-1B visa is probably the most common. H-2B is for seasonal labor, someone coming to work for like a six month period for the summer in landscaping, for example. Um, there are others on this list here. Um, an L visa is for an intracompany transferee, someone coming from a company abroad to work for a subsidiary here in the United States. O and P visa are for athletes, artists, and entertainers. Um, R visa is pretty common. We do those a lot. Religious workers, religious worker coming to work as a minister or in a traditional religious function. A TM visa is for someone coming from Canada or Mexico to work in a very short list of jobs through NAFTA. Others might be like someone working for the consulate, Mexican consulate may be on a government or a diplomatic visa. Student visas are F and J. Um, OPT is the period that you work after you graduate from uh, your degree program for one year. ST and U are victims of violent crimes. So the T visa is victims of human trafficking. A U visa is if you've been the victim of a crime and you've been helpful to law enforcement in the investigation or the prosecution of that crime. K visas are for fiancés, someone coming. Have you heard that 90 day fiancé show? Anyway, that's, that's a K visa. You're coming to the United States to get married within 90 days to your US citizen fiance, and then you apply for your status. Temporary protected status, TPS, is someone who's coming uh, or who has come to the United States because they're, they've been um, in something like war or, or a natural disaster or something along those lines like Haiti or um, El Salvador, we've given TPS to various countries that have gone through that, but it's supposed to be temporary. Um, we typically extend those. So those are non-immigrant visa categories. Is your head swimming yet? Okay, what about immigrants? So an immigrant, again, is someone coming to live here permanently, Lawful permanent resident is the legal term. So lawful permanent resident, you've all heard the term green card, right? Green card, that's, we throw that around all the time. That is synonymous with lawful permanent resident, okay? So you're a lawful permanent resident or you have a green card. Um, you are probably going to seek a green card through an immediate relative, uh, through family or through employment. There are various ways where you can be on the path to a green card through your US citizen spouse, for example, um, a, maybe a job, maybe you're working at a uh, Indiana University and you're 
um, you're a faculty member and they want to keep you permanently, you're on an H-1B, they would petition for you to get a green card. An asylee or refugee, um, those are people who are coming, they're fleeing persecution in their country. They have been persecuted on the basis of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or social group, and they have been harmed or they fear future harm. Um, refugee is someone who's outside of the United States who um, has been determined to be a refugee and then goes through vetting for years before they are resettled in the United States. An asylee is someone who's already here in the United States and they are applying for asylum affirmatively in the United States. Um, these Again, these are immigrant visa categories. So if you get asylum or refugee status, you are lawfully here in the United States, able to stay, work, live permanently. VAWA is Violence Against Women Act, um, and SIJ is Special Immigrant Juvenile. So there are categories, humanitarian categories, for these folks that have been victims of crimes. Um, and then again, naturalization after you've been a permanent resident for three to five years. Three years if you got your permanent residency based on marriage to a US citizen and five years for any other category. So those are the immigrant visa categories. Now, what about undocumented immigrants? So if, you don't, if you're not a non-immigrant or an immig immigrant visa, um, you might be undocumented. We have a very large population of undocumented immigrants in the United States. Um, the numbers, we don't know how many because they're hard to track. They're hard to count by definition. They're undocumented. So what is an undocumented immigrant? Someone who comes on a visa, one of those non-immigrant visas, and they overstay. They stay beyond the expiration date. We call that an overstay or someone who's EWI, enter without inspection, E-W-I. In my world, we call those EWIs, and that is someone who crossed the border illegally without documents, without a visa, and came to the United States, and that is an EWI. So those are the two types of undocumented immigrants that we see, um, and then state and federal laws use the term illegal alien, as we already discussed before. Um, so why does that matter? If you're an overstay, you can only fix your status in the United States if you are an immediate relative of a U.S. citizen. So someone, for example, someone who comes on a visa, a student visa, for example, they marry a U.S. citizen, that person can apply for adjustment of status to, to a green card because they're an immediate relative of a US citizen, okay? But they can't fix their status if they, if for any other reason, like employment-based. So let's say you have someone to come here on an F-1 visa or a B-2 visa and the job wants to petition for them, their employer. They cannot petition for them if they're an overstay because they're out of status. Can't fix someone's status unless they're in status, unless it's an overstay situation and an immediate relative. If you're over 21, you're no longer an immediate relative. So let's say, for example, there's a daughter of a US citizen. If she's over 21, she can't fix her status because she's over 21. She's no longer an immediate relative. If you entered in a lawful non-immigrant visa status but overstayed, you're not eligible to change your status to another non-immigrant visa. So that means if you came on a B2 tourist visa, again, and you wanted to get an H-1B, for example, if you overstay, you can't get that visa. You can't fix your status if you're not in status. So then also there's this complicating factor that if you've been in the United States, for over 180 days without status and you leave the country, you will be barred for three years from coming back. If you have been in the United States for 
one year of unlawful presence, you leave the US, you will be subject to a 10 year bar. So have you ever heard someone say, well, just go back and come back the right way. Go back to your country and get the visa and come back the right way, right? Should be easy enough. Well, it's not. It's almost legally impossible in many situations because if you've accumulated unlawful presence and you leave the country to try to fix your status, you're gonna be barred for either three or 10 years, depending on how long you've been here. So why do we have so many undocumented people in the United States that can't fix their status? Because there are only certain categories of people that can fix their status. And if you leave the country, you can't come back. Right? So this is the law. So there's a catch 22. You're here, you can't fix it. You leave, you can't fix it. What do you do? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> but what would you do? I mean, think about it. If someone told you, someone like me, who's an immigration attorney tells you, well, nothing I can do for you. You've been here too long. If you leave the country, you're gonna be subject to a 10 year bar. What do you do? You have family here, you have maybe a job, you might be un undocumented, but working illegally or whatever. What do you do? You probably end up staying because the alternative is more risky. What if you're an EWI? Remember that EWI, entry without inspection. If you entered without inspection, guess what? You cannot fix your status in the United States. So someone who came across the border illegally comes to me and says, I married a US citizen. Can we fix my status? No, the answer is no, not in the United States anyway. You have to leave the country and you have to apply for a visa outside of the United States and you're subject to the three or 10 year bar. There is a waiver of the three or 10 year bar if, now listen closely, if your qualified relative would suffer quote unquote extreme hardship. What is that? Extreme hardship means a long list of things. You have family here that you need to take care of, financial hardship, emotional hardship, um, health issues. Somebody has health issues and they need, they need medical attention. Um, employment in the United States. You've been here for a long time. You'll suffer persecution if you go back. Any of those things in combination, it's not enough to say, I love this person and I wanna be with them or I will suffer financial hardship. That's not enough. You have to have a huge financial or huge extreme hardship case. So, so if you came to the United States without inspection, married a US citizen, you could fix your status outside of the United States if you get a waiver. But anyone else, let's say an employer comes to me and says, hey, I've got these guys, they've been working for me for years. I just found out that they're undocumented because they told me they've been working with false documents. What can I do for them? I need them. I need them desperately. I've trained them. They were part of our family. They've been here for 10 years. I want to fix their status. I don't care how much it costs me. What happens? What's my first question? My first question is, how did they enter the country? If they're EWI, no possible way, unless they marry a US citizen and can qualify for a waiver. But that job in and of itself, not gonna be a basis for them to fix their status. So imagine that I've got company, a large bakery, commercial bakery had hundreds of people that they found out were undocumented. They lost half of their workforce and there were maybe a handful that I could help. Steel company in uh, Anderson, Indiana had 10 guys 
that they had invested in and found out they were undocumented. Couldn't, couldn't help, not one of them. There was something called 245i here, 245i. 245i was something that we did back in, um, well, the last time was April 30th of 2001. And before that, it had been done twice because the three and 10 year bar was passed in, in a huge comprehensive immigration bill package in 1996. Who was president? Clinton, right? Okay, so Democratic president passes the three and 10 year bar. Now, it was part of a big comprehensive overhaul immigration buried in a bill and Congress, um, I don't remember who was controlling Congress at the time, but he gets the bill and signs it into law. And then we went, uh-oh, what do we do? And then they said, okay, we're gonna make this law 245I. So 245I came in 1998 um, and again in 2001. Who was president then? Bush. And so Bush passed 245I um, under that Congress and said, okay, 245I says, we know you're here. We know you're undocumented. We're going to let, we know you're subject to the three and 10 year bar. We're going to let you stay and fix your status here in the United States. If you have a relative that can sponsor you, if you have a job that can sponsor you, we're going to give you an exception. We're going to waive that three and 10 year bar. You don't have to leave the country. You can pay a fine. You can show, you know, meet all the requirements and, and then we'll fix your status. You're eligible. Okay. That worked out really well for a lot of people. But the last time it happened was April 30th of 2001. Then what happened after that? 9-11. And so everything went out the window. We went, no, nope, no more. We're not doing this anymore. We're going to, and the rhetoric and the, the blame and everything started to roll, right? And we haven't seen, we were going to do 245I again but not after 9-11. So we have this three and 10 year bar with no exception. Um, when I get a 245i case, it's like uh, amazing. We don't see those anymore. I've got maybe one or two. Um, and we get so excited when we, oh, this is a 245i, we have, oh, there's an option. We can do something for this person. Uh, but other than that, it's a lot of bad news. Um, and then there's something called 212A9C. We call it 9C for short. 9C says, if you came to the United States illegally for once, you stayed for more than a year and you leave for your father's funeral or whatever reason, and then you come back again a second time illegally, guess what? You're not eligible for that waiver. So I've got a couple people who marry U.S. citizen, have children, U.S. citizen children, but they have more than one entry and stayed for more than a year in between. They're 9C. They're stuck. Can't fix it. Okay, so then there's these family-based preference categories. So if you're not an immediate relative, you might fit into one of these preference categories to get a green card. These are uh, first, second, third, fourth. Um, let's look at second preference. Let's say you're um, unmarried, over 21, you're the daughter of a US or of a permanent resident. Can you fix your status? Well, maybe you'd be in a preference category where you can file the first step in the process and maybe, um, uh, and wait. We'll see how long you have to wait in a minute. Um, but these are some of these preference categories if you're not an immediate relative. Same thing for employment-based preference categories. Um, when I was working at Indiana University, we had a lot of these um, EB2s, we call them EB2 second preference. So you have an advanced degree. So you are uh, faculty, you're a professor, you've got a PhD. Um, that is an advanced degree. And um, we, you're here working on an H-1B visa already. 
we want it, we want you to stay because you're tenure track. We want you to stay. We want to keep you. So we're going to file an employment based permanent residency EB2 for you and get you a green card. Um, so those we were doing those a lot. Um, fourth preference religious workers. I've got a couple of ministers that they've been here on R1 visas and they are going to they want to keep them permanently. So we're going to do a permanent residency for them. That's an EB4, an investor visa in the fifth preference category is, I've never done one because they require a significant, and when I say significant, I mean $1.8 million of investment and creation of at least 10 jobs. So the investor visa isn't just, oh, can I buy a gas station? That doesn't work for the investor visa. It has to be something much more significant. So that's um, almost prohibitive for a lot of people. We don't do those. We don't, I don't do those very often. Um, okay, so I'm going to pause here and I want to show you something. Okay, so this is the visa bulletin for upcoming March of 2021. And why does this matter? So I'm going to scroll down here and you can see, so people say, well, where do these preference categories come from? Okay, where do they come from? Well, they come from a law that's very outdated about, gosh, more than 30 years. I think it was the 96 law. Oh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe before that. But um, so here is this quota system. It's a quota system. So immediate relatives, spouse of a US citizen, there's no limit on the numbers that we can get. But for those preference categories that I just showed you, um, those are like family-based preferences, employment-based preferences. There's only so many visas per year, okay? So it says here, family-based sponsored preference limit is 226,000. Employment-based preference is 140,000. So this means in one year, they cannot approve more than that amount of visas. And no one country can get more than 7% of the total. So that means if you have more applicants, you're gonna get into a backlog situation. Like for example, Mexico, China, India, the countries that have more applicants are gonna exceed their 7% and they're gonna create this administrative backlog, okay? So here's the family sponsored preferences and I told you about, so my friend Victoria, for example, she is the, the daughter of a permanent resident. She's over 21, okay? She came to the United States on a non-immigrant visa, but overstayed. Now you know what that means. She's an overstay. Mom is a permanent resident. Mom married a US citizen. Mom fixed her status as the immediate relative of a US citizen. Victoria though, is over the age of 21. So how long does Victoria have to wait for mom if mom petitions for her to get a green card? Any guesses? Five years, two years, I don't know. Let's see, let's look down here. So Victoria's from Mexico. She is, that would be the 2B. So right here, F2B, unmarried daughter of a permanent resident. F2B, guess what? They are currently processing cases that were filed July of 1999. So how long does Victoria have to wait if she does it through her mother to get a green card? Well, that's about what, 99, 22, 22 years. Mm -hmm. 22 years. So what happens to Victoria during that time? Well, we're gonna talk in a minute about DACA, which was under the Obama administration, Luckily, Victoria qualified for DACA. She had no status because she's in this backlog. She, and while you're in the backlog, you have no status, no protection from deportation, no authorization to work in the United States, nothing. So in Indiana, she was paying out of state tuition because we can't, we passed a law that says you can't pay in state tuition if you're undocumented. And she got DACA 
when the Obama administration put DACA into effect. And then luckily for Victoria, because she entered with inspection, right? She, she was an overstay. Guess what? She fell in love and married a US citizen. And so because she married a US citizen, she was then the immediate relative of a US citizen. And because she was an overstay, you all know this now, she could fix her status in the United States. Victoria is now a permanent resident and she finished IU School of Law and she works as a public defender. So you can see how someone who was once undocumented could possibly go through a path and become documented, but only if these pieces fall into place because she's not gonna fix her status based on mom given this horrible backlog. C here means current probably wondering F2A is spouses and children of permanent residents. So that's good. So if you're a spouse or child of a permanent resident, you don't have to be separated from your family, right? Forever, you can fix your status. But the rest of these are all backlogged. Now, you may have heard there was some rhetoric and some uh, commercials on TV even um, purporting that this, uh, what do they call it, um, chain migration. Did you hear that? Chain migration, oh, you can bring your all your distant family relatives to the United States and people can bring anyone they want. That is completely false, completely false. These are the only categories, these are the only categories and you know now, that even if you're in one of these categories, you're gonna be waiting for years, okay? What about family or employment-based? So here's the employment-based. So let's take my example, professor at IU, PhD, EB2, okay, advanced degree. Let's scroll down. So let's say we've got doctors from India, right? We've got tech IT people from China that are working at IU. So how long do they have to wait for the second preference? Well, look at this, India's backlog, January of 2010. So what does this mean? This means the person is already here. They're usually in an H-1B visa, a temporary non-immigrant visa, working in the job at IU already. And we wanna keep them here, we wanna get them a green card. What do we do? We have to file, we have to advertise for the position, make sure there's no qualified US worker that can fill that position and get certified. And once we get certified, great, we can file the I-140 petition and we've proven there's no qualified US worker. The person is in the job and guess what? We have to wait in this backlog for, 11 years until the university can get the person the green card. So we have to keep renewing their H-1B visa over and over time every three years until they can get that green card. So it's very frustrating, especially if you're in the, the China and India, right? Because we've got so many applicants because they happen to be in those fields where we need workers and we can't find qualified US workers to fill those positions. So that's kind of, that's the visa bulletin. So I'm gonna stop share and I'm gonna go back. So now you know, you know the answer to this question. You guys can answer this question. Why can't they just get legal? Because there are the backlogs, five to 22 years, you just saw them. EWI is not eligible to adjust status in the United States. Three and 10 year bars keep people from fixing their status here or there. 9C says 10 year bar with no waiver. And there's only 85,000 H-1B visas available per year. So you have people graduating from IU, Purdue, lots of Purdue engineers, 
who are on F1 student visas and Cummins wants to petition for them to get an H1B visa to work for them. And there's only 85,000 visas available per year. So if you don't get selected in the random lottery that's going to open March 9th through March 25th, then guess what? Plan B, go back to school, leave, marry a US citizen. So you know the answer to this question. Okay, so what happens? What if, what if you get put in removal proceedings, removal or deportation proceedings? Well, first of all, so people think if you're gonna get deported, what happens? Well, you don't just get put on a bus and sent back tomorrow. That's not how it works. You, there's a process, there's due process. There is usually a hearing in removal proceedings before an immigration judge. Um, you do have a right to an attorney, but it's not like criminal cases where you get you know, a public defender. You have a right to a, an attorney, but you have to pay for your own attorney in immigration court. Um, it's administrative. So Im immigration court is not criminal. It's not a criminal proceeding. It is administrative before a federal administrative law judge. Um, there are backlogs. So people who are placed in removal proceedings, I had one the other day who is an asylee. They're applying for asylum and the asylum office rejected, didn't reject, but referred their case to an immigration judge, which means they get put in removal. And they were freaking out thinking they were going to be deported in three months. And I said, no, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be set for a hearing, master hearing, the first hearing. Then you're going to be set for an individual hearing. Guess when that's going to be? Probably 2024. So it's okay. You're not going to, you're going to be here for a little while longer, at least. So um, now under the Trump administration, we had uptick in detentions of easy targets, meaning anyone was detained. Mothers, children were detained, um, put into jail. Um, and now we're seeing a relaxing of that a little bit under the Biden administration with the priorities shifting a little bit, um, saying that, you know, if certain priorities for terrorists or criminals or pe bad people, right? Um, so that's kind of, that's removal. So lack of immigration status leads to no social security number, but guess what you can get? What's an ITIN? Individual tax identification number. What does that allow you to do? pay your taxes. Does it allow you to work? No, it doesn't. So who has an ITIN? You have an ITIN if you can't get a social security number, which means you're undocumented, which means you're working without authorization or with false documents. But with the ITIN, you can pay your taxes. The government knows and people, it makes very sure that people can still pay their taxes, even if they're working illegally. Um, even if you're working illegally, you're still paying payroll taxes and you're paying into the social security system money that you will never get back because you're undocumented. Um, also, you're not eligible for a driver's license or a state ID card in the state of Indiana. Some states, I think a handful of states may have given undocumented immigrants uh, driver's licenses, but Indiana is not one of them so far. Decreased access to college and no financial aid at all. So in Indiana, like I said, we say if you're undocumented, you cannot. Uh, pay in state tuition at our state schools. Um, and you cannot get any financial aid. Limited health care coverage. Undocumented immigrants can only qualify for emergency room assistance. So they're not on Medicare. They're not, you know, getting, getting uh, health care coverage and other means. 
They're not eligible for public assistance or unemployment benefits. You can only get unemployment benefits if you're authorized to work in the United States. There are mixed status families. Remember Victoria? Victoria is the was, not anymore, but she was the only person in her family who was undocumented. Everyone else had status. So what do you do? And perceived lack of legal remedies. So there are, you know, people who may need to seek custody of their children or may need a divorce or may be an abusive relationship or um, what else, may not be paid, uh, some employer is taking advantage of them. So they're afraid, they're afraid to go to court, they're afraid to file an, a claim, they're afraid uh, because they're afraid that immigration is gonna show up and take them. So there's also fear of seeking help for mental health and addiction issues um, and the stigma attached to that. There are, so the policy updates we'll go through um, now, some of these things, um, DACA, as I mentioned, I'll tell you in a minute what that means, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, that was under the Obama administration. The Trump administration tried to end DACA that was unsuccessful, went all the way to the Supreme Court. Now we're back to um, the Biden administration trying to bring revive DACA and bring DACA back to initial applications. Um, travel restrictions, um, under the Trump administration, there were many travel restrictions from mainly Muslim countries. Those have been canceled by the Biden administration or revoked. Public charge, public charge was something that we, um, um, has always been ar around, but wanted to make sure that immigrants were not getting public benefits, even though they're not eligible for public benefits widely. So we wanted to doubly and triply make sure that they were not getting public benefits. So, well, the Trump administration implemented this public charge rule, new rule, and now the Biden administration is trying to reverse that. Um, the Biden administration has pre uh, created this family, re family reunification task force for, um, you heard of the unaccompanied minors and the children, uh, families that were being separated at the border. Um, and there were hundreds of families that were still separated or are still separated. And so they're trying to get those families reunified. Um, the asylum system is has been, I mean, I'm saying badly broken and I laugh because the whole immigration system is kind of badly broken, but the asylum system, they're trying to revamp that. Um, the Trump administration was making it very difficult for people to seek asylum. They extended the period where you could had to be an asylum applicant at, before you could get an employment authorization from 150 days to 365 days. So someone here who's trying to get asylum and fleeing persecution and can't work until they get an employment authorization, the Trump administration made that harder for them to get an employment authorization. And now the Biden administration is reversing that. Um, the Biden administration has presented the US Citizenship Act um, where they will, um, it's, I have not read it, I've not gone through it, and largely because it's nowhere close to being passed at this moment, we are waiting to see what will stick. We, you know, they've thrown a lot of things out there and we gotta see what sticks. Um, it may be a piecemeal legislation approach, um, it may not even happen this year. As you all know, because you're educated on this kind of stuff, I'm sure you, you've heard, you can only pass a bill with the 60 votes in Senate. And so, unless it's a budget attached to budget reconciliation, and then that's 51. So unless you can make immigration reform part of budget reconciliation, you're gonna need 60 votes in the Senate and whether we can get those 60 votes is, we don't know. So is this gonna happen? We don't know. Um, it is one of the top four priorities 
Um, but we'll see. Hope, I mean, I'm more hopeful now than I have been before because we've got the momentum and the ability that, you know, the control rests with one party. And when you have that, you're more likely to get things done. But there's still that, you know, the issue of filibuster and all of that. So the Trump administration also um, made an effort to make it harder to become a US citizen for folks that were here. They increased. So when you become a US citizen, you have to take a test, a civics test. You, you all should look at the civics test. You have to memorize 100 questions about the United States. And then you're asked 10 questions. Out of those 10, you have to get six right, okay? The Trump administration increased that to 25 questions. Um, and that did not go into effect because now the Biden administration has reversed that and said, we're going back to the, the 2008 10 question test. As I mentioned, enforcement priorities are shifting and we also expect to see the ceiling of refugees that the US will accept, hopefully will increase as under the Trump administration, it decreased down to 10,000. And so Exodus Refugee Resettlement and Catholic Charities were having to lay off half of their staff because they weren't resettling refugees anymore. Now, under the Trump administration, we expect that to go back up to, um, we don't know what level, but it's been all the way up to 100,000, I believe. Um, and so we'll see what happens there. So DACA, I mentioned DACA as under the Obama administration. Here's the requirements. I'm not going to read them. But the point for DACA is, you remember Victoria? Okay. People say, well, why do we need DACA? Why can't they just fix it? Well, we needed DACA because people like Victoria, who had no status and no options to fix their status, who came here as children at a young age through no fault of their own um, and were going to school and had no other, you know, didn't know what else to do. Um, gave them a path, Some gave them something. It didn't give them any permanent solution. It only gave them two years of employment authorization, which meant you could get a social security number and a driver's license, which is huge, and get in-state tuition at our state schools because you had lawful, lawfully present. And it gave you two years of prosecutorial discretion says, we're not gonna deport you. We know you're here, we're not gonna deport you, but we're not gonna give you permanent residency or US citizenship. This is a temporary little fix because the Obama administration determined through a lot of research and working with law professors and that that was what they could do under the executive authority without legislation. Anything else, would require legislation. And so under the Trump administration, when they tried to end DACA, the fight was, or the argument was, DACA is unconstitutional because it went beyond the executive authority. And I will tell you that even the courts can't decide or are down party lines, partisan, in whether this is, within the president's executive authority. Um, and so that's kind of a question that has been up in the air and now, and even the courts have upheld DACA and the Trump administration was unsuccessful in terminating DACA. So it, DACA still exists. Um, oh, I, this is outdated. I put currently waiting SCOTUS, that's not right. Um, it, we already had the SCOTUS decision. Sorry, I missed that. Okay, so public benefits. So you know now anybody with a social security number pays into social security. Anybody with an I-10 pays taxes. Anyone who owns property pays property taxes. DACA are paying taxes lawfully. Mixed status families are not eligible for economic stimulus or other public benefits. So in the large, the grand scheme of things, there's always a question about how much does illegal immigration cost the US. 
And I'll tell you, it depends on who you ask, first of all. It also depends on you know, who's doing the research uh, because you can skew data in a lot of different ways. But for the most part, it has been found that immigrants, illegal or undocumented immigrants, pay into the system more than they take out. So what do we do now? Well, you guys are, you are all smart, intelligent, and you're educating yourselves, which is really, really, really important to understand this issue and to recognize the value in immigration. Um, and then, and only then, once you understand how the system works, can we identify these real challenges and opportunities for change? Um, I think it's really cool when institutional forces um, come together and create these unlikely partnerships. Like, for example, when we get an immigration bill and we can get conservatives, liberals, uh, religious groups, we can get the faith groups, we can get the business groups, we can get the law enforcement groups all together to advocate. People who traditionally would not be on the same side of an issue have united in support of immigration reform. And I think that's really important to recognize that whether you're a conservative or a liberal or a moderate, frankly, immigration is an issue that should be bipartisan um, and should, if it's done right, should be really great for the economy um, and for families. Those are the two you know, tenets of immigration is how the economy and family unification. <clears throat> so I try as much as possible to use real, real people and real stories because I think it's really important for you to hear about Victoria and hear about those the steel company and, and the bakery and all of that because these are real people and real, um, real consequences, unintended consequences. Um, again, research is important. Talk to your elected officials. Talk to the people that you vote for, Republican and Democrat alike, because we need to give everyone that ability to vote for the issue and not think of it as a political issue all the time, because that's what it has become. It's all, all about politics. Um, don't be afraid of the immigration process. And then, and then uh, I think, again, really important to note that this all begins with community. The community that you live in. And a really great example of this is Columbus, Indiana. Columbus, Indiana, where Cummins is, and all these amazing manufacturing companies who rely on immigration, they depend on immigration for innovation for technology, for all of these things, they have really done a great job at making sure that the community embraces immigration. Here are some resources for you, the ones that I love, um, and I can share this with you later. And then here's my contact information. So with that, Linda, I am done. I will turn it back to you and hopefully we will have some Time for questions. Yes, and uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat that have come out. Um, let's start with uh, a simple one. What do you think the main components that a functional immigration policy should include? <laughs> How much time do we have? Um, that's like my, that's like, gosh, if I could be queen for a day and make all the changes, I would, what would I do? First of all, um, again, I think good, good sound immigration policy should be based in economy and family. So how are we gonna support our economy? How are we gonna fill the jobs that we can't fill? Pre-COVID, we had so many jobs and not enough people. 
we just frankly aren't having babies fast enough. We're, we can't fill the positions. Manufacturing sector can't fill the jobs. Uh, restaurant and, and hospitality can't fill the jobs. So how do we make that? We need to get this quota system that's super outdated into the real, real current um, situation and evaluate this based upon what are our needs? What are our needs as an industry, different industries, because they're not all the same, frankly. What are our needs in different industries? How can we get the people, the talent that we need to be competitive? And then how can we keep our families together? Um, so those would be my two basic tenant guiding tenants, I think, but um, a lot of specific things, like I would get rid of the three and 10 year bar. I would, I would get rid of 9C. I would, I mean, there are a lot of different things that, that you can do to make the immigration system work better. I would bring back 245I because I thought 245I was really good because it said, we're not going to let just anyone come to the United States. You have to show that you have a job that's willing to sponsor you or a family member that can sponsor you. And but for the three and 10 year bar, you would be eligible to fix your status. That's how 245I worked. And I think that is really good because it said, no, we're not just going to let anybody come in. But if you have these things and you can prove it, then you know, we'll work with you if you pay a fine and you you kind of seek retribution for whatever you did wrong, right? Because there's a large population of people that think, well, you came to the United States illegally, we should not reward that. And there's that's a very good point because you can't provide, you know, how do you, you can't incentivize illegal immigration, but how do you fix that so that, you know, you get the people that the law isn't the creating the problem. I hope that kind of answered your question, but. Yeah, so another, there's another question. Uh, what do you say to people who would respond, immigrants take our jobs? So um, I think you, I would look at research first of all, because that's largely not true, um, factually not true. And it also depends on the industry. Um, so there are some industries like STEM fields, STEM fields, again, we can't find enough qualified workers. Um, so we need, we need the workers. Um, agriculture, agriculture, they're definitely not taking our jobs because we can't find people to do the work and the work needs to get done or else we are going to be out we're going to be looking you know outside of our country for uh things that we can grow inside of our country um we need those agricultural jobs filled so that we can sustain um uh again i mentioned restaurant and lodging you know they largely depend on an immigrant workforce um, I mentioned manufacturing. Some of these places, again, in, in Columbus, Indiana, can't find people to fill the manufacturing jobs. So it depends on the industry. It also depends on the time, right? So pre-COVID is a little bit different than during COVID because COVID has impacted people and people have lost jobs. So we can't just make a blanket statement um, I think you have to qualify that. I think saying saying that that statement, immigrants steal our jobs, is kind of a cop out because it's a lot more complicated than that. So another question uh, from one of our members: What about those too poor to pay fines and play the system well? That's a great question. Um, so. I would equate this to if you found out that you were very ill and you had some medical bills that you had to pay to stay alive, you usually try to find the money. That becomes your first priority, um, whether you have health insurance or not. So yeah, so people find the money, they do. Um, the fine was $1,000 and that was under 245i. Um, I think when, when you're looking at immigration, it's, it's really about life and, and 
um, livelihood and taking care of your family. So you'd be surprised people do find the money. Um, there are also nonprofit um, organizations that will do low cost or no cost pro bono legal services. And they're there like um, Indiana Legal Services or Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic. They will take cases and um, there's more, a lot more, there's a list of them, but um, they'll help people who don't have the means to pay for an attorney. But the, there are filing fees for almost everything. Asylum does not have a filing fee, um, but almost everything else does have a filing fee. And, and by the way, USCIS, if you didn't know this, is one um, agency, government agency that is run, um, majority is run by fees, not by taxes. So when we had the government shutdown, immigration did not shut down. USCIS did not shut down because it is run, I think, the, I don't know if 90%, something pretty high because everyone pays a filing fee for every process that they go through. So that might be an incentive to keep those fines in place and expand. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, if you can run an agency based on fees. You keep those fees coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Actually, we, and we have an example, um, Mary Dollison posted in the chat about uh, a person from Jamaica who's, who's been trying to get a green card for 12 years. Mary, do you want to unmute and say anything more about her? Yes, um, this young lady has been with us um, just to be able to exist. I met her at, through Ball State and um, she's living with us now, hard worker and trying to do everything she can to be able to get a job. You know, she works for different people who will pay her a little money just to, you know, exist. Yeah. And I'm just so frustrated. And I know there's another person on here who could speak more to this is Lauren Widener. And she can tell you what we're going through. She's trying to help us to help her too. Mm -hmm. So she's probably stuck in this situation. And most, so she's probably an overstay since she's from Jamaica, I would guess. Um, and then once you overstay for so long, there's, you're stuck. There's nothing you can do to fix your status. And if you leave, you're going to be subject to that 10 year bar. So I would imagine that she's probably in that situation. But she did leave Muncie and go to uh, Florida University and got her master's degree there and uh, straight A's again. And she came back to Muncie after she was working for a school there or something and she could, they couldn't keep her. And that's why she's back in Muncie. Okay, okay. So she's- Could I add that they couldn't keep her because when Trump right. became president, it his administration shortened or I can't think of what I'm trying to say made it smaller they could she was not able to keep her employment based visa okay so he put restrictions on the numbers there was a quota and she, she was outside that quota is that what you were saying Lauren that is what she uh, that is how she explained it to me. It was 2016 with the change of administration that her visa was unable to be renewed by the employer. And so they reluctantly let her go. It was not something they wanted to do. Okay. Um, yeah, I would have to, I don't know the specifics, but I would have to, if she hasn't talked to an immigration attorney, she should. Um, and, and let me make a plug real quick that it's really important for people to talk to a qualified immigration attorney, um, just like going to the doctor. You're not going to go to a brain surgeon if you have a heart issue. Um, you need to go to an attorney who understands this area of the law. I don't do anything else. I don't do criminal law. I don't do um, family law. Um, my, my colleagues who do family law don't do immigration law. So 
you know, we all respect each other and, and there are a lot of very, very good immigration attorneys um, that, and she should speak to one of them. Someone who's a member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association would be my, my go-to. Hey. She has spoken with a lawyer, I'm not sure who, but, and paid a lot of money and is waiting. And mm -hmm. she has also talked with the legislators and she's done everything she can possibly do. Okay. Okay, uh, we've got two more questions and we're gonna, then we're gonna quit. <laughs> this is very interesting and it just keeps us going. Um, how does the minimum wage affect employment figures of citizens versus immigrants, non-citizens? Minimum wage, um, how does the minimum wage impact? I don't know the answer to that, but largely in my experience, the jobs that are, you know, immigrants are in, um, people say, well, it's immigrant labor is cheaper, right? They say, well, you an employer, you're just employing immigrants because you can pay them less. But in my experience, I, do not, I don't believe that's true because a lot of times the market dictates what they have to pay. And because there's you know, high demand that they can, um, you know, they make the, the, what they're supposed to be making. I don't know how the minimum wage would impact different industries because there's, I mean, that's again, a complicated question um, depending on the industry that you're in. One final question. What do you say about the argument against immigration that America is pulling the best from other countries and thereby depriving those countries of some of their best resources for improving their own economy or government or communities? I think if you would talk to companies like Cummins and Eli Lilly and some of these you know, global companies, that are doing amazing work, cutting edge work, they depend on the best and the brightest, regardless of what country you're from. They're looking for top talent. Our universities, our research institutions, we depend on innovation. We depend on great minds and diversity of thought. And that is what immigration and done right, if it's done right, that's how it should work in any country. So by we, I mean, if I have not studied different countries immigration policies, but um, I believe that some countries have better immigration policies than we do. And they do things differently depending on the demand, the need, the economy, and they revisit these numbers and things every couple of years because it's never gonna be the same. Depends on the time, the what's going on in the world. Um, so I think that, you know, having good immigration policy allows the US to maintain the competitive edge. Um, and our industries and not just, I think, because we are a leader, we as a country are a leader in global thought that our ability to attract the best and the brightest really helps everyone, not just the US, but every country. I don't know. And the number of American citizens who go elsewhere on various visas to work also contribute exactly to the mix. exactly yeah yeah somebody said it better than i did it sounds like the world is made better wait what did she I, where did that go it's there it sounds oh. like the world is made better when corporations and institutions are able to work with their best and brightest people regardless of their citizenship yes that's what i was trying to say <laughs> <laughs> thank you angela um and I know if there are other questions, we could conceivably post them to you. But I think this has been very informative. Thank you. It gives us a much better understanding of what the ins and outs are mm -hmm. uh, and the need to call you if something, if something comes up. <laughs> um, Anytime, happy to help. 
So Judy, I'm gonna call on you to talk about our next meeting now, if you will, please. Thank you again, Angela. And just as a personal note, um, I have a, a son who's married to a German national and they've been living married in Germany for seven years and they called a consultation with Angela and she gave them the scoop on what they need to do, but it will be a very long drawn out process. And when Patrick went to Germany, all he had to do to get legal status in Germany is prove that he was married to Steffi and that he had an education and was able to support himself. That was it. There was uh, no extreme cost involved. There was no waiting period. It was, it was almost immediate. So, um, and you think Germany is a pretty advanced country. So it's not like they're just letting everybody in, but again, um, we have decreased population here and in Western countries. We need immigrants, period. So again, thank you, Angela. Um, our next session is, again, we've had to be very flexible because of people's prior commitments. So the next uh, session is gonna be at a little different time. We're going to meet on March 13th at 1230. And it's going to be with a couple of our representatives. Um, just as a note, I contacted everyone several times, both Democrat and Republican. We've had three acceptances. Uh, Tim Lannan, the Senator, uh, Sue Arrington, the representative, and Elizabeth Rowray, the representative. Um, the rest of them have not gotten back to me or declined. So I hope you'll all come in and ask about the, the goings on at the State House and uh, it'll be great. Thank you. Thank you all. And we will see you in March, if not online before that. Thanks, Angela. <laughs>